DOP Chairman John McLean, who has really been a wonderful leader. Very fortunate. You know, we're going to get back at it in you know, April elections in 2014. Yes. 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 But uh, he had a committee meeting tonight, wasn't able to make it, so they called me in to, to take his place. Um, we are excited to have somebody like Mark Mix. He's the president of the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation. Um, he also serves as president of the National Right to Work Committee. And it has 2.2 million member uh, public policy organizations. So it's a really big organization that's helping to, uh, to look out for uh, uh, the interests of conservatives. Um, he, be, he became president of the foundation in 2008. He's uh, appeared on uh, many television shows, uh, like Fox, New Caputo, uh, Fox and Friends, CNBC. Um, he also has written for the Wall Street Journal, the Washington Times, Investors Business Daily, um, among others. Um, he also he travels around the country. He's a good uh, he's a speaker on how to fund the active and political process. Um, Maybe we'll talk a little bit more tonight. I know we're always here in St. Clair County thirsty for more information on how we can be more uh, efficient, uh, Chris and committee men and volunteers, and, and try to really share our message. Uh, he has a BA in finance from James Madison University, and uh, prior to joining the National Right to Work Committee in 1990, he worked for several uh, state level right to work groups. So without uh, taking up any more time, Mark Mix. Thank you very much. It's really great to be here. But my more important role, and uh, this is oftentimes left out, but it should be at the very top, is I am a husband and a father of six children. I have uh, five daughters and oh, yeah. five daughters and one son. Um, we've sent, my, my wife and I, of 23 years, have sent our first daughter to college. She is a freshman at William and Mary University in Virginia. Uh, my, my next daughter, Jessica, who is about 11 months younger than my oldest daughter, is uh, just got accepted to a, a college last night. Uh, when I got home, she, there was a letter waiting, uh, waiting there that she got accepted to one of the colleges she used to. I have uh, another daughter who will be entering high school, and then a son who's in sixth grade, a daughter who's in fourth grade. And the one that keeps me young still is Madeline, and she's my first grader. And I, I'm convinced now that the longer we have young children, the younger that we stay. So I, my wife and I have talked a little bit about how we might fix this. I'm not sure it's physically possible to have younger children, but we may think about having younger children somehow, one way or the other. But uh, they are the blessing, and they are what, what the reason I do what I do um, from a standpoint of trying to give them what we try to give all of our children, and that is a country that is better than we can. And this road for me of politics has been an interesting one. I, uh, I, was, I grew up in the public school system, the government school system, and my social study teacher, I have a, my mom uh, is a single parent, I have two other brothers, and we grew up very, very poor in western New York, way over in Allegheny County, New York. Anyone ever been to Rochester, New York? Okay. Everyone ever heard of Hammondsport, New York, where they, they have wine there, Finger Lakes region? Well, if you go south there, about, about 20 minutes from the Pennsylvania border, you go to the county of Allegheny, which has more dairy cows than people. And so I grew up with a, with a family of dairy farmers and uh, grew up milking cows at 5.30 in the morning and, and moving hay and cleaning up that stuff that is a byproduct of all that other stuff. And uh, so it was, a, it was a great place to grow up. It was, it was very nice. My mother worked very hard. She was a waitress in a little truck stop there uh, that, uh, that she had to get up early in the morning and my brothers and I um, uh, we'll take care of ourselves, really going to school, and, and they're, they're really, really great men. I, uh, I've been blessed, God has blessed me with just wonderful brothers who've been great role models. Um, and, uh, uh, but that part of, the, of that, I tell that reason for that story because the man that had the most impact on me as growing up in school was an extremely liberal Democrat social <laughs> I had no idea, uh, you know, growing up, uh, I was more interested in doing other things than studying about the American experiment. The American experiment with individual freedom. And so, like many young people in the government school system these days, they get information that drives them in a particular direction. 
it talks about it now. We have to be more <coughs> talking about, uh, you know, quote families and uh, with, with the reference to your bill, uh, what that really means. Um, but he was he was a very very nice man. He helped me and and he got me registered when I was 18. Uh, before I graduated from high school, he got me registered as a Democrat. And, and I was I was uh, went to his house. He would host political fundraisers at his house, and I'd be the guy that would clean up and serve drinks and that kind of thing. And I started hearing this philosophy. And it wasn't until I got out of that small town, kind of got into the world, like one day I woke up and I said, I don't need it now, I'm going to end up being here. And that, was, that wouldn't have been a bad thing. Don't get me wrong, it wouldn't have been a bad thing at all. But I ended up going to college in Virginia. Um, I went there, didn't know anybody. And I ran into people there that had a different worldview. A worldview that was predicated on protecting individual freedom, on protecting liberty, and on remembering and, and maintaining the integrity and the principles upon which this country was founded. And I can't think of any other way to describe it. There's lots of more academic ways to describe it. But America is a great experiment in individual freedom and individual responsibility. Those two things, is that if I asked to describe to my children what America is, I would say those things. I would also say that our documents, our constitution, our declaration are divinely inspired. There's no question about that. Our founding fathers, the framers of this great nation, and those great documents knew human nature. They knew human nature. They knew what men would ascribe to if they were left to have the accumulate power on their own. They had been through it. They'd seen it. Unfortunately, we're back at a point in time now where we've forgotten about those things, and we have people in power over us who are striving to take that power and use it in violation of our individual freedom and individual liberty. And any given day, you can hear a debate about that, whether it be the Second Amendment or the Fourth Amendment. You know, I went through the TSA line today. I had a search. <laughs> I had an illegal search uh, of my person without my consent. Uh, uh, you know, I do not go through the millimeter weighing machines or the x-ray weighing machines, so I object every time I go, and so I'm getting a search warrant every time that I walk out. <laughs> you know, it's a matter of principle. Um, it really is. But the bottom line is, when we get to individual liberty and individual freedom, I would, I would have never recognized the issue of right to work as a fundamental issue that plays on that platform, that foundation of individual freedom. Um, my hometown, most of the folks that I interacted with, they were, they were union members, they were proud union members, AFL, CIO, Teamsters. My stepfather, my mom remarried when I was about 15 years old, well, actually 14 years old. He was an International Association Machinist member. He was a welder at a factory in Gainesville, New York. And I remember when, I guess when we were 15, I guess I was 15, we walked the picket line there, they went out on strike, and, and uh, there was a picture of me holding the company. And it's kind of an interesting picture. I say this so we can all look at it. Because you know, that is important as well. Understanding and protecting a worker's right to join you is something that's just important to me and our organization as the ability to protect a worker from making his own choice about union membership, and that's what right to work is about. But back then, I would have never had any idea about this. When I got to college and I started understanding the issues of individual freedom, individual liberty, a few people came around me and started talking to me about that. And all of a sudden, one day, I bump into the issue of right to work. And you know, it's not a sexy issue. It's not a marquee issue. It's not the kind of issue that we talk about, like taxes and guns and life and marriage. Right to work is one of those issues that after tonight, you're going to be convinced it is the most important issue. That's my job. <laughs> we'll see how well I do. I, I know that uh, there are other issues that we supersede. But let's talk about it in the context of what right to work means and what it is. We're having a big debate on right to work in Missouri. Missouri. We had a tremendous debate about right to work in Indiana. And we had an even better debate about right to work in Michigan. Over that way, right? Do I get my bearings right? <laughs> Where am I here? He's a, he's a former aviator. Right. All right, good deal. Good deal. Good deal. But the issue is so simple. But if you listen to union officials and you listen to the media about right to work, you think that it was designed to destroy the very essence of America's working men. I would suggest to you tonight, and I propose to you tonight, as we talk about the issue of right to work and discuss it, and hopefully at the end. These lectures usually go on for four or five and a half hours. Um, Mary, is that? So you said about mid-hour. Good, 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 good. good. I'm a suburban, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
No, hopefully we'll have a chance to answer questions because I know you have questions about right to work. But let me just get into the very basics of the issue of right to work. We now have 24 right to work states in America. In two states, Indiana and Michigan, passed it in 2012. Indiana was the culmination of about a nine-year battle, uh, beating up on Democrats and Republicans, unfortunately, I'm sorry to say. Um, and it was it culminated in, on February 1st of 2012 when Mitch Daniels signed the 23rd right to work law in America. And then on December 11th, Governor Rick Snyder in Michigan signed the 24th right to work law. Michigan. All places. Who would have You know, you and Illinois may make it discouraged. But I'm telling you this, if we can pass a right to work law in Michigan, you know the old Frank, Frank Sinatra song, if we can make it there, we can make it anywhere. And there is reason for optimism, because freedom is growing. I would suggest to you the idea of freedom in the workplace is, a, is an issue whose time has come again. We had these debates back in the 1930s, and I'll give you a little historical background of how the issue of forced unionism came to be in America. You won't be surprised by this, but it's important you understand how we moved from the Constitution, the First Amendment, the right to associate, which presupposes the natural right not to associate must, must exist, right? You can't have this right to associate without the right not to associate. So in 1787, the First Amendment, the Bill of Rights said, we have right associational rights. And tonight, we're exercising that associational right, that, assembly, that right to assembly, to talk, to hear our views. So from, 1980, from 1787 to 1935, everything was grand. In 1935, Franklin Roosevelt did what Rahm Emanuel had said when he was the White House Chief Executive Guard, never let a good crisis go to waste. Remember that guy? You, you still have to deal with him, right? We don't have to deal with him anymore. You do. I apologize for that. Yeah, I apologize for that. But what happened in 1935? The country was in some fiscal trouble. I think it was a, it was a result of, of governmental actions previous to that that caused this. But Roosevelt grabbed the opportunity to dramatically increase federal power during that period, 1933, 1939, throughout that period. And one of the major provisions of the Roosevelt agenda was the federalization of labor policy in America. No, prior to 1935, the Supreme Court had struck down something called the National Industrial Recovery Act, the NIRA, which was an industrial policy for the United States. It said that the federal government will impose this industrial policy on the country. The Supreme Court said no. The Tenth Amendment, the, the, the states' rights on these policies, and they struck it down as unconstitutional. Well, Roosevelt would have none of that. In 1935, they reintroduced the Wagner Act in the U.S. Congress. In the U.S. Congress, it passes the House, it passes the Senate. During this debate in Congress, there's speculation that the Supreme Court will have nothing to do with this. They just struck down a very similar bill, um, it's very similar legislation under the National Recovery Act. What's different about the National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act? Well, Roosevelt made sure it was different. He went to the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court and said, you will rule this constitutional. And the Supreme Court Justice said, excuse me, I'm paraphrasing, this happened in nine years <laughs> Historically, this is somewhat accurate uh, in principle. It's very accurate in principle, somewhat accurate in detail. Um, and Roosevelt said, no, you will rule this constitutional because if you don't, then we will just add six new justices to the U.S. Supreme Court, we'll make it 15, and we'll get this done one way or another. You can keep, your, keep the integrity and the support of nine, the support is nine members, or we'll go to 15. And this is where that famous saying, a switch in time saved nine. This was the history of that. It was over this bill. And why was this bill important to Franklin Roosevelt? Because I would propose to this, well, there's been several others in the, since then, but at the time, this was one of the greatest usurpations of states' rights by federal authorities that we had seen. Of course, there was more to come after that. But the idea of taking labor policy that was heretofore managed in the states, if you had a problem with your employer, you went into the court system, regular kind of civil court common law doctrine ruled labor management relations in America. Some of you may say, well, that wasn't good enough, but I'm telling you the federal solution was a bad idea. And we're man the, the manifestations of that federal solution are what we're seeing today in the, work in, the, in the marketplace and in the workplace. So the Supreme Court switches in time. They uphold the Wagner Act as constitutional. They set up a five-member National Labor Relations Board, and they write a policy that governs private sector workers in America that comes from Washington. And that is where we've been since 1935. Interestingly enough, in that original 1935 document in that legislation, 
They gave union officials the right to bind us without our consent. Now, this is a very interesting juxtaposition with common law. You know, we're a common law doctrine nation. We base our law on the fundamental law of the Constitution. Then we come down and we use the precedential establishments of laws to back up the other laws that we make. And hopefully, you get a fairly well-structured legal system that is, is predictable and stable. Because that's what we need to have. We need to have some idea of what it is we do being right or wrong. If you don't know what's right or wrong, we're in big trouble. Um, so, but in 1935, the federal government said, no, we're going to take this whole notion of common law, this notion of agency, and we're going to stand it on its head for labor policy. Are there any lawyers in the room? One. Okay. <laughs> that's good. That's good. That's just about right. One more. That's good. Okay, good. Yeah. And, and he's not a lawyer. He's an attorney. Our guys are attorneys, their sides are lawyers. lawyers. Okay. Yeah. Remember, we're attorneys. So the attorney in the room. Now let's talk about the elements of a contract. Okay, the elements of a contract, many of you may have learned this in, in business law in college perhaps, or as an attorney, hopefully he learned this in law school. And we'll ask him some of the elements. Give me three elements of a contract. Consideration. Consideration. Okay. Mutuality. Mut meeting of the mind. We have to agree. Legality of purpose. Right, legality of purpose has to be legal. And then the fourth one, probably is most important when it comes to organized labor, is no duress. I can't put that attorney under a, under a duress to agree with me contractually. In order for us to establish an agency relationship where we can work for each other, bind each other, and represent each other, we have to have those four elements. He got all four. I was only asking for three. How much do your hourly rate? <laughs> <laughs> he knows his craft. He's an attorney. I recommend it now. But so, so in common law, we have those four elements of a contract. In labor law, do we have a meeting of the minds for someone who doesn't want to join a union? No. Do we have duress? Yes. yes. Do we have consideration? They would argue that there is consideration that somehow the worker reaps benefits. I will talk about that because that's the, probably the most pregnant of the issues that union officials use against right to work. But also, we, we, we don't have elements of contracts, but yet under federal law, I can bind him as my agent without his consent. He doesn't have to vote for me. He doesn't have to ask for me. He never wanted me in the first place, but yet he must comply with my wishes. I am the only representative for him in the workplace. If we're in a workplace, and you are all in our bargaining unit, they call it collective. I don't call it collective. It's a monopoly bargaining unit, because it's not collective. There are no such thing as these collective rights because his rights have obviously been violated. So it's a monopoly unit, and I'm the only spokesman in the place. Now, my attorney friend over here happens to be a great lathe operator, too. He runs a lathe operator on the side. Sometimes attorneys don't pay well. <laughs> but he's a very good lathe operator, and he can make eight widgets an hour and then go do legal work in the evening. He's really good at this. On the other hand, Al over here, he's, he's not bad. But he only, he only makes four widgets an hour on his lathe. And Fred over there, that guy, he's really a slacker. He only makes two. Yeah. Art doesn't even show up half the time. But guess what? Guess what? Because we're all in one bargaining unit, he makes, he makes less, perhaps, than Art, because Art's been here for five years. He's been here for two years. And yet he has to take that. Is that a benefit for him? Is that consideration for him? No. So we've established that labor policy, as it flows from the federal government, violates the basic tenets of, a, of, a relation, of an agency relationship. So on its face, on its face, it's a violation of individual freedom. Because I can have this attorney, I can have this lawyer fired if he decides to talk to somebody else besides me to talk to our boss, or if he doesn't want to pay me for the privilege of working, I would have him fired. Okay, so that's... That's kind of where we are foundationally with labor policy, and that's how it developed. So in 1935, things are going extremely well for organized labor. Union density increases dramatically. Their numbers are up beyond anybody's wildest dreams. John L. Lewis, remember John L. Lewis, the, the president of the Mine Workers Union, decides to use World War II as a leverage device to make demands on the country. And what does he do? He tells his mine worker body, he says, you know, slow down a little bit. We, uh, we can, we've got some really great leverage right now because the country needs coal to make steel, to make the war product, to defend our, our brothers and sisters who are overseas fighting the enemy. And we've got great leverage. They'll give us anything they want as long as we keep the coal coming. We can make the steel. We can make the war machine. And John L. Lewis uses this and says, you know what? We've got this power. Let's use it. 
And so he, he asked the mine workers to slow down and puts our war machine in jeopardy. So 1946 rolls around, there's an election, and they throw out a lot of people in Congress. And 1947 comes around, and Congress says, you know, back in 1935, I think we made a mistake. We created this, this monster monopoly um, that is organized labor. We gave them power out of all proportion of their numbers, gave them power that ordinary citizens don't have. We ought to take it away. And Senator Robert Taft of, o of Ohio at one point indicated he wanted to repeal the entire National Labor Relations Act. But you know what happens in Washington once you get something? No. Do we ever get to take anything away? No. no. We're learning that lesson right now under the sequester, and that's a whole other issue. Talk a little bit about that too if you want. But right now we'll stick to labor policy. So Taft says, this hasn't worked. Let's throw this out. We, we're, we've created this monster that can hold us hostage. It's not a good thing. But instead of repealing the National Labor Relations Act, the Wagner Act, he makes an amendment to it. And they add some amendments, and they kind of fool with it, and they tinker with it. And you know, it's like government. They, instead of ending the problem, they regulate the problem. And this slippery slope that we go down, we end up down in this, in this morass where we really don't even recognize what the original purpose was in the first place. So Taft makes some amendments. And what they said then, they said that, you know, we gave union officials too much power. We need to roll it back. And instead of repealing the compulsory unionism that exists under the Wagner Act in 1935, we're going to allow states to affirmatively outlaw the closed shop. Meaning, if they can muster the support, and they can go to their legislature or by their people, and they can say, we want to repeal forced unionism, you can do that, and you can become what is known as a right to work state. So the Taft-Hartley Act of 1947 said, this federal usurps of power was pretty big, we made it, you know, we went too far, we won't kill it, but we'll allow the states to pass right to work laws in 24 states have. You'll be interested to know that no private sector worker in Illinois is forced by an Illinois statute to pay union dues to get a keep a job. That authority for union officials to have that worker fired comes from the federal government and the National Labor Relations Act. That power is resident there. So despite Ronald Emanuel's dreams of using his power to force everyone into the unions, he doesn't have to because the federal government takes care of that. And that's why, for many of you who get emails from National Right to Work or from Mark we talk about the National Right to Work Act. The National Right to Work Act was just introduced uh, three weeks ago by Senator Rand Paul from Kentucky. We have 10 sponsors on the bill at this point, I think, and the House bill will be introduced, in, uh, what's today, March 1st? It'll be introduced next week, I think it is. Or today's, tomorrow's March 1st. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be introduced, I think, next week uh, in the House. We'll have Steve King from Iowa, will be the sponsor of that bill. And we'll have about 45 to 50 co-sponsors on that bill. And that bill is a very interesting bill. For, for those of us who've been kind of following Washington, we think about the Obamacare bill, which was, what, 2,248 pages, right? And we think about the, uh, the, the, the bill for uh, whatever piece of legislation or government program, you know, they usually set it on a table and it's usually about this tall. Well, ladies and gentlemen, the Right to Work Act, I will, I will show you what it is. It's one. It's a one-page bill. It does not add a single word to federal law. It simply repeals the provisions in the original Wagner Act that allow union officials to have a worker fired for failure to tender pay dues. That's all it does. Wow. Now, does it protect a worker's right to join a union? Absolutely, because that already exists in the law. Does it protect a worker's right to bargain collectively if they choose so? Absolutely. Doesn't change a thing. Can any worker in America pay a union dues if they want to? Absolutely. And they should be able to if they want to join. Remember, labor unions are private organizations. They are businesses too. And if someone wants to join them and be represented by them and create an agency relationship like my attorney friend and I have created with using the elements of a contract, more power to them. More power to them. I'm going to ask now because it's, it's kind of tied into Scott Walker up in uh, Wisconsin. They, they, they don't have necessarily a right to work, but they limited collective bargaining for the teachers. How, how is that going to affect his state now? Yeah, well, that's a great question. I, I'm going to get to that. If I don't get to it in. Uh, what we say? Yeah, I'll yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If I don't get to it by the way. No, I will get to that. That's a very important distinction. Okay, very important distinction. We talk about the private sector. And what, where we've been so far, we've been talking about private sector workers. We will talk about government sector workers and the differences between the two. 
Very critical difference. And what Scott Walker did, while he did not eliminate bargaining, he limited it. And that's, that's important. I think he should, personally, I think he should have eliminated it. And I'll explain why in a minute. <laughs> okay. So in the private sector, no private sector worker in Illinois is forced to pay dues by Illinois law. It's by federal law. So the National Right to Work Law would simply repeal those provisions that authorize a worker to be fired for failure to pay dues or pay to union. That's it. In the meantime, until we get that passed, and I'm confident we will pass that someday, I have to be optimistic about that. In the meantime, we will continue to work at the state level to pass state right to work laws. We already mentioned Indiana and Michigan. We, I was in Jefferson City uh, at the beginning of this month testifying on the right to work bill there. There are six bills pending in Michigan, Missouri right now that would make the state a right to work state. Um, let's see, you've got four in the Senate, five in the House and one in the Senate. Um, we've had debates and hearings on those bills. Uh, Kentucky's introduced a right to work law. Our goal is to completely surround Illinois. I'm telling you this, my megalomaniacal plan of world domination <laughs> puts me in charge of, of, of putting a fence around Illinois to the point where they have to concede and say that freedom will work here as well. Let's talk about the impact of right to work. Because we talk about what it did do and what it doesn't do. It doesn't destroy anyone's right to bargain, anyone's right to join a union, notwithstanding all the rhetoric you heard. I think Mark Reardon read a letter, letter to the editor today on uh, WMOX. We did an interview with him a little bit earlier. He read a letter from, from a classic union worker that said, you know, this will destroy my job and destroy my right to a union. It, no, no. I put together a folder for each one of these, these kind of lies that we hear about right to work and about freedom. First of all, they talk about it takes away your right to join a union. No, it doesn't. You know, in the 24 right to work states, there's a lot of unions. In fact, last year in 2012, the union density in eight right to work states actually increased. That was good news for organized labor. Now, why do you think that happened? It happened because union officials now are being held accountable by rank and file workers. When they're going out and do the crazy political stuff, when they go out and do all this other stuff other than represent the workers on the shop floor, the workers now have something to say about that. They say, stop it. And if they don't stop it, they say, okay, you don't get any more of my money. That's one of the benefits of right to work. It holds union officials accountable, forces them to come back to the workplace where they claim to represent the workers and do their business there and not in Springfield or Jeff City or Washington, D.C. Unions in America today are wards of the state. Their power is a resident of this federal labor policy, the Wagner Act and the Taft-Hartley Act, and it's also a resident of the power that they have at the state level, like they had in Wisconsin. And they have in Illinois. I mean, you've got every single public sector bargaining law that you can imagine. Illinois is the prototype for any state looking to corral all their workers into union monopolies. You're it. You do that really well. You're number one. You're number one. You're number one. We're number one. We're number one. We're number one. We're number one. Yeah, okay. All right. But you are. And that's sad. That really is sad. And you see it. And you see it in the policies, and you see it in the condition of your state. So, so now we have we have the national right to work law, we have our state right to work laws, and that brings us to the idea of bargaining in the government sector. Now, government by definition is a monopoly. Government by definition does things that can't be done by the private sector. Now, we know that's not true anymore because the government's involved in studying the catch-up running down a maple plank and digging tunnels under highways and for frogs and, and all kinds of fun stuff and sponsoring cowboy poetry festivals in Texas and uh, all these things are going to be cut at midnight tonight. <laughs> oh. <laughs> put this in, let, me, let me make a tangential leap here on this question because this is, I was sitting in a meeting with uh, Senator Rand Paul and Senator Ron Johnson from Wisconsin about, and they talked about the sequester and what it really meant. I mean, if you, if you listen to the media, turn on the media today, what's going to happen at midnight tonight is very serious. Planes are going to crash. Things are going to be, it, it, mass layoffs, food, cats and dogs, real wrath and hot stuff. <laughs> Old Testament. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Old Testament stuff. The fact is, we're talking about 3%, we're talking about 86 billion dollars out of 3.3 trillion dollars. 86 billion out of 3.3 trillion. Now, I, I can't, I'm, not a, I'm a government school student, but I get this as being roughly 3%. That means if we have a $100 bill, you take $3 from me, that's it for me. I fall over debt. <laughs> and you'd think, 
that they, I mean, based on what the president and this is why they've got to attack Bob Woodward so vehemently. Those are the fathers. Bob Woodward, you know, he's no friend of ours, really. But because he, you know, it's that old story you tell your kids about the emperor who has no clothes. Look at my finery. You know? If you can't see it, you're foolish. And some little kid walks out of the crowd and says, he's got no clothes on. And finally, everyone realizes that that's the, he's been, he's been, you know, lying to us. And this president is doing that on this. This is a pure political play. I mean, and then, and then to, just, to, just to finish this up, because I don't want to take too much time here. Um, but it's 3% in gross dollars. But if you take it, it's 3% less than the increase. The increase. So it's not even a cut. We're going to spend 1% more. We're spending 1% more on government if we cut 3% because it would have gone up 4% of your baseline budget. That's where we are. That's the sequester. And this is the leading story in the news. Leading story in the news. He, you know, the president goes down to a shipyard in, in my home state of Virginia, in my state of Virginia, the Commonwealth of Virginia, stands in front of a huge propeller and says, hey, this is over. What? What? And, they, and we take a general the American public takes a hook, line, and sink. So, anyway, getting back, okay, that's my sequester. I don't have to go out there anymore. But now we're coming around to the government sector. We're talking about the monopoly that is the government sector. Now, we've already explained how the union official gets a monopoly over all of us here by, by saying, I'm the only one that can represent you. So we, we've established this is a monopoly bargaining unit under in an on right to work state where they're bargaining, where they have exclusive bargaining representation, where, we, where they have this violation of agency relationships that we talked about. Now you take this monopoly bargaining unit and you apply it to a monopoly government. And you say, these guys, the union officials that control this group of workers, now negotiates with this monopoly over teacher salaries, police officers, firefighters, EMTs, over necessary government services. Well, this is just like John L. Lewis in the coal mines, only he did a little more, he was a little more subtle about it. You know, yeah, we, we, we can affect the entire nation, industry, industry by, by holding back a little bit of the coal. In the government sector, they can stop the necessary services that government's supposed to provide. Now, our Constitution enumerates specific powers for government. There are government, there are enumerated powers. I think, I say there's 26, someone argues with me about that. I think there's like 27 or 28. He's going to look it up. But we'll get an answer to that. I'll leave that around 11.45. But the point is, the point is, now we, in this model, it was, it was Franklin Roosevelt who was asked when they were passing the Wagner Act in 1935, why don't we just do this for government? Franklin Roosevelt said, you can't do this in government. It's unthinkable. It's intolerable that we would bargain with government. We would apply the union model in government. In 1955, it was George Meany, then president of the AFL, who when asked, said, why don't we do this in government? Because you can't. The only rights that we as union officials have with government are the same rights that every other citizen has to redress their government. We have no greater right than any other taxpayer. In 1959, the AFL-CIO Executive Council said the same thing. Well, a funny thing happened in 1957, 58, 59, in Wisconsin, ironically, of all states, Wisconsin was the first state to recognize union officials for purposes of bargaining over government employees. So it is a little bit ironic that Scott Walker is the first government that says, we can't do this anymore. They've been doing it longer than everybody else. It was Wisconsin, then New York City, and now, ladies and gentlemen, now there are more government union members in America than there are private sector union members. Now, if you look across the Great Pond into countries like Greece and Korea and France, you begin to see what that means and what's coming in America. It's the ability to shut down the entire government when their demands are not met. So what did Scott Walker do? Scott, Scott Walker came into office. They were looking at a $3.6 billion deficit in the budget. He said, there's no way. We're not going to raise taxes. We're not going to raise the cost of government. Wisconsin had one of the highest costs of government in the country. He said, we're going to reform the way we do business in Wisconsin. And what we're going to do is very simple. We're going to stop bargaining over everything else as it relates to government employees. We'll, we will continue to bargain over their wages, but we're not going to bargain, bargain over what health plan we, can, we, can, we, can, we have to use at the state. We're not going to bargain over what hours these people work and what, you know, how, how many vacation days they get or who, what person with one day seniority has to do this job or that job. We're going to bargain over wages, but everything else we're going to put back into the government. We're going to let the supervisors and people who run government run government. And you thought this was the end of the world. This was another sequester. 
Well, it's interesting enough, the laugh comes out, the progressive liberals, the school board members who've been elected by the teachers union that forces people to pay money so they can elect politicians who give them more power, that in turn let, allow them to collect more money that gives them more power to elect more people. It's a vicious cycle <coughs> they just keep working and working and working. We're familiar. Yeah, yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I'm in Illinois, right? I forgot about that. Yeah. Sorry, sorry, that's right, I should have known better. So, 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 so this, this vicious cycle continues and Walker says, enough. And so what does he do? He says, one thing we're going to do is we're going to allow the school districts to negotiate their own health care products. Under the current regime, they were forced to negotiate with the teachers' union over the health care product they were supposed to use. They, there was only one choice. So the moment the school boards got to negotiate new health care products, they saved 40% right off the top. School board members in Milwaukee, of all places, are saying, this is pretty good. We didn't have to lay out any teachers. Every teacher's coming back to work. We, we got 40% more to spend. And the healthcare product, believe you me, if you run small businesses or you're covered, you know how expensive healthcare is. So all of a sudden, all of a sudden, the people that were there marching and the doctors that were writing prescriptions for people saying you can have a free day off and you know shutting down the school system, all the people look at this and say, you know what? This wasn't such a big deal after all. And you know the best evidence of the Wisconsin experience is this. The American Federation of State, County, and Municipal Employees Union had monopoly privileges over everybody here in the bargaining unit. And you know what happened the moment that Scott Walker passed the right to work law for public sector workers? 52% of all workers said, we're not in it anymore. We're out. We're done. We're done. <laughs> the teachers union up there, WEAC, the Wisconsin Education Association, files an affidavit in case, they're, they're litigating this case, our lawyers are now representing Wisconsin employees trying to protect that Act 10, and we're going to win it, it'll take some, while, take some time, but we're going to win it. We won, just, we won a major battle last week in, in a little town called Greenwood on behalf of the school teacher there that helped to cement this Act 10 in place. But the teachers union files an affidavit in court saying that if this is allowed to stand, our ability to continue as a going concern, any accountants in the room? <laughs> any auditors in the room? You know, if you're, if you're running a business and your auditor comes and says, I doubt these people can continue as a going concern. That's not good news. <laughs> going concern means you keep going. If you're not a going concern, it means you stop. And if you stop, generally that means you're out of business. And so what the teachers union said was, we believe that if this is enforced, our ability to continue as a going concern will be seriously jeopardized. What were they saying there? They're saying we have no way of convincing anyone to send us money voluntarily, and we need the force of government to do it. Exactly. I mean, if there was ever, I mean, I can talk about right to work till I'm blue in the face, but if you want to know how it really works, go talk to the workers in Wisconsin who are exercising their rights. Go talk to the union officials in Wisconsin who are so used to government power that allows them to have a worker fired for failure to tender 60 bucks a month. Go talk to them about what it means to them. In one case, it means freedom. In the other case, it means the world is over. Their world. Their world is over. That's right. Their world is over. So, so in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin, Governor Walker, we wish you would go farther. We wish you'd expand those protections for private sector workers. We wish you would get out of the business of, of bargaining with unions at all. And I, I need to make that, I need to conclude that argument because I believe, personally, that government employees, while well, they should have the right to unionize, they should have the right to join unions and pay dues to any union they want, any private organization. The question that we grant this guy, he's a big guy, he'd make a good union official right here. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you know, right? you know will we say that we as taxpayers have to let this guy negotiate away our tax dollars? You know, yeah. How <laughs> was he did? How was he did? into that. Yeah. 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 You see why the founding fathers had to put they had to put checks and balances into our system. You know, look at them. I'm more against unions than we are. <laughs> yeah, okay. All right, all right. <laughs> well, the point is, the point is, is that we shouldn't give a private organization, a labor union, the right to get between us and our government. And that is what we've done by recognizing government unions for purposes of bargaining in the public sector. Without ending that, we're going to have trouble. You're going to have trouble in Illinois. In our state of Virginia, we actually have a statutory prohibition against it. In 1993, one of the first legislative projects that I really got to kind of run on my own, we introduced a bill that said everyone in Virginia has the right to join a union, everyone can pay dues, everyone can go to the Capitol and yell and scream and hold signs, no question about that. But we, as a commonwealth, 
will not negotiate with a private organization. So we had no bargaining in Virginia. You know what state has been ranked the ten, you know, the top fiscal state for the last 20 years by, or last 10 years by Financial Times? Virginia. North Carolina has the same law. They're in good fiscal shape from a budget standpoint. The reason is because they don't have a private entity pulling the strings between their government and their people. That's the key. Yes, sir? When you talked about local and state, what about the federal? No. Same thing. Same thing with local. In fact, in federal, in the federal side, they bargain. They bargain, but we do have a federal right to work law. No federal employee can be forced to pay dues to get or keep a job in the federal government. But you know what's what's happened in the federal government is in one sense they the unions they always say the unions have kind of lobbied themselves out of business because of the civil service and all of the all of the requirements in government that say this is the way it works and how it works. But there is still bargaining in government. In fact, uh, it was two years ago, uh, let's see, it was 2013, again, the government school. Yeah. It was 2010 during the land session where the, the Congress came about that close to passing a federal bill that would have required all 50 states in the country to negotiate with firefighters, police, and EMT unions as a condition of getting any federal money. It was really a weird bill. We stopped that during the lame duck session. I don't remember that. That's when Harry Reid had 59 votes in the Senate. And they had the House. We stopped that. They tried it three times in the lame duck session to pass that bill, and we beat them. And they, of course, they don't bring it up now. But I would say in government, you allow them all to join unions. You allow them to join voluntary associations to make their, their, their uh, will known and their, their demands known, if you will. But you cannot insert a private entity into that system and say, you have power over taxpayers and you have a special, a special power over your, our elected officials. You just can't do that. That's the key. Is yes, there a difference to answer this question? I work for labor relations in the federal side, so one of the things that they can do, they, can, they cannot bargain for salary or any benefits. It's all basically uh, due process and, and those types of things. Yeah. Well, I, I think, and you know, I can make the case, and I think we should make the case, we ought to recognize the difference between the private and the public sector. And when you recognize the difference, you cannot apply the private sector labor relations model in the public sector. You just can't do it. There's a difference. In the private sector, if company A, which company A, is bargaining with the union, and the union says we want these things X, Y, and Z, and they go on strike, there is by definition, for the most in most parts, in almost every situation, there's company B that manufactures a similar good. And so the pressure in the private sector is that if you stay, if you make too many demands, or you stay on strike too long, that your market share, your product, your job may be gone if you stay out for a year. Because company B is already, Ralph's already with company B to get in there and provide all the widgets you need. And all of a sudden you forget about company A's widgets, and that's the pressure on the private sector model. In the public sector model, there is no pressure. No competition. That's right. There's nothing there that pressures the side to come back to the table. That's why one of the things, you know, they say, well, we'll make strikes illegal. Well, when you make strikes illegal, we know that the, in, the increase in strikes frequency increases by four times in states where strikes are illegal. Because what do the union officials ask for? We're not coming back until you grant us amnesty for the penalties against an illegal strike. It happened in New York State with the subway in New York City. It's illegal to strike in New York City. Two days pay for one day you're on strike. Everybody pays. Do you think anybody paid in that last transit strike? No, because what they said was, we're not coming back to work until you forgive us the penalties. You know, I believe in repentance. I believe in asking for forgiveness. But in this case, it's not theirs to get. Yeah. You know, air traffic controllers. There you go. Yeah, you know, everyone uses the air traffic controller strike as this. This was a union busting uh, threat by this guy right here, right? He looks like a union buster. Right? Yeah. You know what we said to those people? We said, look, federal law makes it illegal for you to go on strike. If you, I'll give you 24 hours to come back on the job. If you don't, I'm going to exercise the federal law that says you will be dismissed. He didn't bust you. He just said, this is the law, and I want you to know that I'm the kind of guy that's going to enforce the law. Imagine if a governor had that kind of courage today. Oh, no. Imagine oh, if a president had that kind of courage today. Oh, Imagine if a mayor or a city councilman had that kind of courage today. School board member. School board member. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Because that's really where the action is. You're spot you're on that. Steve has that kind of and My wife is a city yeah. councilman and she has that kind of thing. But that's the kind of, that's the kind of relationship we get when we allow this system to grow where a private group gets power over government, which we shouldn't allow them to do. 
So let me bring this all, kind of wrap it all up in a nice ball, and I want to take questions about right to work because I, either I can answer the question or Ralph can. I, <laughs> and we do have an attorney in the room, so we'll, we'll take our chances that we're going to all right. The issue of right to work is, as I look at Illinois and we look out over the landscape, I'm afraid that you may be the last guys in this, in the kind of this region to get it. But I will tell you that the drive for freedom and the drive for liberty is alive in America. It's evidence here tonight. Americans have been gathering together, talking, mobilizing, organizing since the beginning of our country's founding. I mean, this group is about, about the size of the guys that were in Boston that kind of planned the whole thing. I, I don't know I, for sure how big that group was. But it is this strength in America that I see. And one of the great privileges of, of my job here, and I would never guess, well, I've been doing this for 26 years, I would never guess 30 years ago that I would ever get a chance to speak in front of people like this or talk about an issue like this or be involved in an organization like I am. But as I travel the country, and I've seen the strength and the fiber of Americans. Because we are not, we're not a country founded on, a, on our skin color or our ethnicity or our religion. We're a country founded on freedom and individualism <coughs> and an experiment in self-government. And that, while that, that, that root gets chopped at every day on, by our governments, by our school systems, by everything, there's something about the American experiment that is alive in almost everyone I meet. I don't look for opportunities to, to meet with guys that disagree with me. In, 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 in Jefferson City, back at the beginning of the month, there were about 300 people in the room that disagreed vehemently with my position. One guy said as I was walking away, you know, I'm going to kick your... He was bigger than Ronald, too. He was. He was a big guy. And I stopped. I stopped and I looked at him. I said, what did you say? And everyone, all of a sudden, everyone's quiet. There's a little, you know... I would say 150 pounds, but that's not quite right. Anyway. <laughs> but, you know, look, I'm not a physical person. I don't scare anybody. I don't, what scares our opponents of right to work is you people. They're scared because if people understand the power they've been given over individual workers and individual people in this country, once it's exposed and people understand it, they'll lose it. And like everybody else, they'll have to go out and convince people of their position. They'll have to sell product to America's workers. If they're successful, they will be successful. If they're not, they will go the, by the way that businesses that, uh, what is it, the Edsel? Yeah. Yeah. The Edsel, it didn't sell, apparently, right? I, the Corvair is the one I remember, the Corvair. So, so what we're asking, what we're asking, we're asking, right to work is asking for individual freedom. We're asking for an opportunity for workers to join together voluntarily, but we're asking to end the compulsion that exists in federal law. You can be part of that. I mean, your Illinois delegation, your congressional delegation is scared to death of this issue. What we're trying to do in the United States Congress right now is we're simply trying to get a recorded vote. Why do we want a recorded vote? And who hates recorded votes? Politicians hate recorded votes. You know, if it's, if it's you know, the, the biscuit is the official cookie of the state, if, if this is milk month, or we, we, we were, we're honoring the uh, Smithtown baseball team for their championship, oh, I'm on record for that, I'll give a speech about that. But when it comes to issues of fundamental freedom, of fundamental, the fundamental basis of who we are and what we are as a nation, man, oh man, do they run through the tall race. And politicians will do just about anything to avoid a, a recorded vote. And so as you get emails from us over the next 12 months on the right to work bill, for those of you who are on email list, you'll hear us ask you again and again and again to get your congressman to co-sponsor the bill, to help convince John Boehner to give us a vote in the House, to help Mitch McConnell have the courage to stand up to Harry Reid and say, let's have a vote on this bill. Every time we've had a vote on the issue of forced unionism, where workers have, where, where politicians have to decide, yes, I will continue to force this person, or yes, I will give them freedom, our side wins. We win when that happens. When we can hold the politicians accountable on compulsory unionism, our side will win. It's a slow process. In Indiana, we had to have four votes. In Oklahoma, it took 10 years in Oklahoma. We had, gosh, I want to think, I'd say we had eight votes in the legislature. We lost every one of them. The Tulsa World headline, right to work dies. You know, overwhelming. We got 31 votes in 101 chamber, member chamber. But we didn't give up. We dusted ourselves off, put the battle clothes back on, and went and had a conversation with the people of Oklahoma. You can do that in Illinois. I would encourage you to continue to do it. 
we as Americans are destined to do it, and we must do it. Thank you for the opportunity to be with you. Thank you. First, Mary, would you encourage anyone here to give me, give, give them, give me their email? Thank you. She gets like three a week from us. Mary, 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 You get okay. And this is a perfect opportunity that I, I think most of you know that Mr. Mix came here at no charge to us. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> No, I'll take your email. I'll take your email. Yeah. I think. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. I'm sorry. I start around. Yeah, start around. That's good. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah. The something that is related to right to work is prevailing wage, and 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 it's. I I always have a hard time with prevailing wage. Imagine, if you will, that I'm a non-union highway contractor. Yes, sir. And I've got ten non-union employees. And they're all operated over. And I go on a job that has federal money on. Now I've got a contract with my employees, with nobody else involved. Here. What is the source of the power to have the federal government tell me, you know, the piggy union down the street pays their guys 35 bucks an hour. So because those pigs do that. You have to do that. Where, where's that. where's the authority have to do that? That's a great question. Well, first, obviously it comes from government. I'll explain in a couple ways that it comes. It does. But let's talk about the origin of the Davis-Bacon Law. You talk about Davis-Bacon? Yeah. So-called prevailing wage. This was, again, a Roosevelt-era institution that came, and it was purely discriminatory in its origin. It was designed to keep black construction workers out of the construction industry. No matter, you know, I was in Jefferson City. Not to tell you, not to tell you, not to tell you uh, a story about this. Story. I know you get enough, you get enough of that. But we were in Jefferson City testifying, and this this very very sharp attorney, black female legislator, starts grilling me on these issues of discrimination. Talk about your discrimination. Blah, 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 blah. You know, the unions have all these responsibilities and duties, etc. So I cited her a case called Steel versus Louisville Railroad, 1944, U.S. Supreme Court. Steel versus Louisville Railroad established what union officials like to call the burden of representation. If you talk to a union official and say, well, we're forced to represent every worker, therefore we've got to force them to pay dues. Well, first of all, that's not true. They're not forced to represent every worker. They choose to, because it's what gives them their power over the bargaining unit. So that's a, mis that's a mistake. They choose to do that. But secondly, this duty of fair representation wasn't something that came out of the statute, it came out of the court. Yeah. Because guess what? The union yeah, what's your did not name? represent five Matt. black Who? members. Who? Matt Darkness. That's your They had to accept them as their bargaining agent. So when I told her the story, she immediately was. <laughs> <laughs> and she gave up questioning me. In fact, so then, then three more guys over here, young lawyers, came up. They were lawyers, they were lawyers. <laughs> they started asking questions. You know, they thought they could get one over on this young punk kid. Well, not young. Middle age, well, uh, short. <laughs> anyway, they know they get over it. So we started talking about this discrimination. We talked about prevailing wage. So prevailing wage is a law, and there's a federal prevailing wage law. And right now, this president has signed an executive order saying that any agency that does work, that, that any project that involves any federal government money that's over $25 million dollars will be done with a what's called a project labor agreement, which is even more stringent, and then would also will include Davis-Bacon. Illinois has a Davis-Bacon law, and it says you have to pay the rate that prevails in the marketplace. Well, let me tell you how the rate that prevails is established. Union companies hire people to submit wage surveys. Non-union companies don't. They, they, everybody at the non-union company is working. They're working, doing something. Well, in Oklahoma, we, uh, we helped get a young lady elected. Her name was Brenda Renault. She became the labor commissioner of the state of Oklahoma. And she was in charge of the prevailing wage law there, of enforcement of it. And it's enough she was in charge of the wage survey. So what did Brenda Renault do? She went to the wage survey folder. She pulled it out and said, OK, here's all these wage surveys. Here's a underground tank in wherever it was, county Oklahoma. Uh, Jim, why don't you go out there and see what that's all about? And they go out there, and guess what? 
It doesn't exist. The wage survey is completely bogus. She finds five or six of them. The guy that, the guy that had a job for it is convicted now because it was a sham. They were submitting false wage surveys to keep that wage rate up. We know that Davis Bacon adds anywhere from 18 to 35 percent on every public project you guys do. So if you're in the school business, you can say it this way. Build three, get one free. free. Exactly. If we didn't have prevailing wage, if we didn't have prevailing wage. Now one of the problems with the issue of prevailing wage is you're arguing about wages. I mean, you don't want to argue about wages, really. I mean, Ralph doesn't think he makes enough money. I don't think I make enough money. Nobody thinks that. Everyone thinks we're worth more than we get paid. So when you start arguing about wages, you, you create a whole idea of, well, you're just for lower wages. You're just for not paying people or whatever. No. We're for, we're for a system of government that allows people to compete. If this non-union contract with 10 guys can build that project with a quality and on time the same way somebody else can, why wouldn't you want to pay 10% less? Why wouldn't you want to pay 30% less for it as a taxpayer? You would. But Davis-Bacon laws prevent that. And these laws, we've repealed them. I want to say there's probably 20, I want to say there's 23 states with Davis-Bacon left on the books at the state level. And of course, federal projects require Davis-Bacon, the federal prevailing wage law. But it's, it, first it was discriminatory in nature, based on discriminating against blacks, and now it's discriminatory against anybody who wants to operate a construction company, do government projects that's not union. Can other local units of government below state enforce the Davis Bacon Act? Townships, cities, counties? Yeah, they, most of them will do it because generally, it, you know, if you find a project that only has town money in it, mm -hmm. They can have their own choice. If it has any state money, if it has $1 state money, then it's likely going to be required that it be a, a prevailing wage job. But if, but if it doesn't have any state money, does, does, the, does the city have authority? I think you probably can make the case that the city would have jurisdiction. Not the state of Illinois. Not the state of Illinois. Is that right? The state of Illinois, state statute requires that Everybody? every taxing body, every government okay. unit that hires any kind of a contract sign up to accept the state's prevailing wage rate as dictated by the state DOT or DOL, Department of Labor, or they survey and come up with their own prevailing wage rate, which is about a three-year process and costs hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right. There you go. There's your answer. I knew there were the answer to this one. I love like this shit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Any questions for him? Yeah. Yeah. Can yeah. say what I need? Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Here and then take care. Well, I'm just curious, how come unions are like a business, right? And they have almost like monopoly powers yeah. over businesses. Don't they have a Sherman Trust? They're exempt. They got exempt from the Sherman Antitrust Act. Yes, they did. They're exempt. That's one of the, and that, that's, that's a whole other. How much time I got for time is it? Well, 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 Let me tell you a couple stories about that because they. They are exempt. They are exempt from antitrust laws. They, they, they will not. They cannot be convicted of restraint of trade. You think that having all the mine workers stop working would be a restraint of trade, but it's not. But they're exempt from the Sherman Antitrust Act. Good question. The Interstate Commerce Act. What's that? The Interstate Commerce Act. They're exempt. Wow. Now let me tell you. Let me give you a couple of, of stories. I'm going to start with a really easy one, and then we're going to break right to a close with a major one. This is scary stuff. So. <laughs> in North North Carolina, we just got done litigating a case. We lost the case. But we have a situation where 33 workers had decided to exercise their right to work in North Carolina, which is a right to work state, meaning they did not want to pay dues to the union. The union had done something. They were holding them accountable. They got out. So the union official in charge of this local unit takes their names, social security number, and other private information and posts it on a public bulletin board at the place of work, and then emails it out to other union officials saying, these are the scabs that are hurting our union. So he emails it off. Okay, so what we've got here, what we've got here is a clear violation of the State Identity Theft Protection Act. There's, all 50 states have laws like this that protect your identity. If someone uses your information, sends it, puts it onto a public place, and endangers your identity, they can be convicted under these state laws. Well, in North Carolina, it was explicit. Every violation was a $5,000 fine. It was a certain class of misdemeanor, I forget. Or I think it might have been a class felony down here. I'm not sure. But there are different classes of felonies and all that stuff. But it was down here, like class 5 as opposed to a class 1 or something. But it was very clear that if you did this, and there was no question that this was done. 
There was no argument over this evidence. I mean, I, I don't know what the legal term is, but nobody contested. It really happened. Yeah, nobody contested the fact that it happened or it didn't happen. So we took the case, and these workers came to us and said, this is a clear violation. We want to have them prosecuted. So we went into the North Carolina court, and we said, the entry level court, we said, clear violation of the act. They said, no, they're exempt. <laughs> they're what? Excuse me? Yeah, because oh. the union because the union's operating under the National Labor Relations Act, federal law preempts the state law as it relates to union activity. So we went to the Court of Appeals in North Carolina and they said, we said this can't be true. You can't I mean this is a this is outside of any labor relations or bargaining or anything. This is this is a clear violation of the city one citizen violating another citizen's identity theft rights. They said the Court of Appeals said, We don't think so. They're exempt. Federal preemption. We went to the New North Carolina Supreme Court, they wouldn't even hear the case. We went to the US Supreme Court, we wrote a petition for certiorari with the court. They said they didn't want to hear it. And the reason why they didn't want to hear it, not because they're bad guys, because there's no split in the circuit yet. This is kind of the first, the first blush. And as our attorney will tell us, the, the Supreme Court generally likes to see a conflict mature and get kind of different views about how this all works. But under current rulings of the North Carolina law, union officials are exempt from the Identity Theft Protection Act in their state. I mean, they can take anybody's private information, do whatever it is they want. Okay, so that's not bad enough. Let's talk about union violence. Let's talk about union violence. When you're on a strike line and you get every, all the workers get together at the union hall and they talk about the strike strategy for the night, they say, okay guys, we're going to burn some newspaper trucks, we're going to put put the put the couple of newspaper vendors out of business, we're going to knock down their stands, we got to get all this done by 8 in the morning. And oh, by the way, if you're going to if you're going to catch the mail trucks on fire, make sure the fire department tells us to make sure that the doors stay open so that the car trucks burn faster. That way, when they get there, it'll all be, it'll all be burned up. The union guys work at the firehouse, told us to make sure we're not leaving the doors open. We need to leave those open. OK, guys, go to work. What I have just articulated to you is if we did this today, and we went out and executed that strategy, we could be convicted of a violation of the Hobbs Act, the anti-extortion law under federal law. And as a as a racket, we're, we're kind of racketeering, if you will. We're extorting property from someone by using these violent means. Okay. Well, in a case from 1973, U.S. Supreme Court called Enmons, E-N-M-M-O-N-S, the Supreme Court ruled that union officials could not be prosecuted under federal anti-extortion or racketeering laws for acts of violence that are, quote, this is the court's words, used to achieve legitimate union objectives. Oh, They're exempt. They're exempt from prosecution. In fact, in a, in a great display, this one of the most public displays, you don't hear about this very often, but the, US, the, the Daily News, New York City newspaper up in New York, took a strike in 1991, I think it was. And uh, one day, Governor Mario Cuomo, then Governor of the State, shows up at the headquarters, and he's standing out front on a podium. And 300 uniformed police officers show up to cheer on the strikers at the Daily News. These are our police officers that uh, serve to, to protect and serve. So the, the head of security of the Daily News calls up the FBI agent in charge on the island of Manhattan and says, uh, who do we call? when we have 300 police officers in uniform protesting in front of our building and, and we got security issues. We're moving up. The FBI director says, uh, Manhattan says, we can't do anything about it. They're exempt from prosecution under, under federal law. So, yes, sir. Just, just a real quick question. When you were talking about the trucks getting burned up, the, the actual guy, the actual striking worker that threw the match on the truck, he's not exempt. Yep. They don't get convicted. They don't get convicted. No one. No I, one I mean, the guys that are exempt are the officials, right? It, well, the planning and the organizing and the actual acts. Well, let me let me, let me draw this out a bit more. Because yes, if you caught the guy actually throwing the mat, someone could probably convict him criminally. But the police officers are out in front of the building right now protesting the strike. So, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. pretty hypothetical. Okay. Right? So, well, let me tell you the story of Eddie Lowe. Eddie Lowe from West Virginia. The Lenore coal mine is on strike. The United Mine Workers are striking. Eddie Lowe is a father, father of three, husband of one, and uh, he's not even working for the mine company. He's working at a tailings facility off the site but next to the striking facility. At the end of the day, I think it was just maybe he'd been on the job for maybe a week, I think, or something like that. He pulls out. There's a caravan of trucks going through. Shots ring out. Eddie Lowe is hit in the head. Truck careens over a ditch, flips over in the in the alley. Eddie Lowe is dead. People come try to provide aid. They're pelted with rocks by the striking miners. Striking miners. Everyone knows who pulled the trigger. Everyone knows who pulled the trigger. There's no question who shot this man. The man that pulled the trigger was convicted of disabling a driver of a motor vehicle used in interstate commerce. That was it. 
That was it. That was it. This is this is a privilege that they've been getting that we just can't. I mean, when people hear this, they say that can't be true. Well, I encourage you to go read the Edmonds decision and go look. And and the prosecution, we have documented literally hundreds of thousands of acts of violence, and the prosecution rates around two percent. I don't know if that's standard law enforcement statistics or not, but for this type of violence, that's what's going on there. But the court says, so we've got a bill that we introduce every year that would actually amend the Hobbs Act and the anti-extortion laws and say that union officials can be prosecuted just like you and me. But yet, every year, the, the Democrats, Harry Reid and that et al. And, and Dick Durbin say, oh, this is a retaliation against the working man. Does it go through the House? No, we can't even get a vote. <coughs> Nobody wants to have a vote on it. Because even they, in the House? Not even in the House. We have never had a vote on the bill, sir. Never. We have, that's all we ask for is a vote. Mary, you know from our emails. We're just asking for a vote. We, yeah. we don't expect to win. Just give us a vote. Make them pull the, push the red button or the green button. Second motion. Yeah. No, yes, sir. Uh, wait, I, I'm sorry. I had a question here. I'll come back to you. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm a business owner, and that's happening in front of me. Yeah. And they're starting to destroy my business. I pull out my registered 45 caliber gun. Okay, okay. Mr. Attorney, you need to stand up here with me now. <laughs> <laughs> and I shoot them. Yeah. And I'm defending my property. Will I be arrested? Yeah. 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 Be honest about this. The corollary is if they, if they, if I come onto your property and I pull out a gun and shoot you dead, even if it's in the context of labor dispute, I suspect I would be prosecuted too. But let me give you some context in West Virginia and 13 other states that have what's called a Little Norris LaGuardia Act, and this is the the, ability, the inability for a judge to get an injunction to stop the type of violence. In West Virginia, in order for the state police to enforce the law, in order for them to go arrest the guy that pulled the trigger, shot the guy, they've got to get permission from the governor of the state. Now, the governor of the state is an elected official, right? right? Remember how we talked about this vicious cycle about how unions lobby politicians to get more power, allows them to collect more dues, to elect politicians to get some more power, let more dues? Well, if you're the governor of West Virginia, are you going to go ahead and tell the state police to go get those United Mine Workers militants? You're, you may, but you're going to think about it. It now becomes a political question as opposed to a law and order question, a question of justice. And when you inject politics into any of this crap, you usually get the, the wrong answer. That's what happens. Okay, let's see. Here and then we had one here. Okay. A month or so ago, uh, Circuit Court, I think it was in D.C., struck down uh, Obama's uh, ability to, to <coughs> appoint those three board members. And all yeah. Yeah. What, I heard, heard that, that somebody was asking them to... Uh, Put that in place because the three board members are still working. Yeah, that's right. That's us. That's the national yeah. So what, what are you? Okay, you're you're asking a real question. I didn't tell you to ask that question, did I? <laughs> I want the record to be read that I didn't ask him to answer that question. He's talking about this is this is the fun stuff, ladies and gentlemen. This is where you get a glimmer of hope. Barack Obama on December fifteenth of two thousand eleven decided that he was going to nominate three members to fill the five seats of the National Labor Relations Board, and he was going to use his executive power to nominate and to appoint a, a Richard Cordray, the former Attorney General of the State of Ohio, as the Consumer Financial Protection Board spokesman, or whatever. Okay, so December 15th, he says, I intend to nominate these people. Okay, on January 4th, and for those of you who did not go to government school, tell me how many days that is. <laughs> December is 31 days, so 15 to 31 is 16, and 4 is 20, right? Okay, we don't count Christmas, we don't count New Year's because they're holidays, right? So how many did I have 20? 20 minus 2 is 18. We're at 18 days. We've got some weekends in there. How many weekends do we have? Let's say we had just for 4, let's say we had four, 4 weekends, 4 days, 4 days, 4 days weekend. So we had what? We had 18 minus 4, we're now at 14. Okay, and the day before Christmas, no one works anyway, right? Yeah. Let's take that one. That's Christmas Eve. New Year's Eve, let's take that one away. Uh, <laughs> the 14th, where are we now? 12. 12, okay. So we'll start. With that's as far as we need to go. What day? What day? <laughs> 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 January 4th. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so Martin Luther King Day didn't come in. How many days are we down to now? 12. 12. Okay, we're 12 days. Right. Eight days. Why do we get to eight? Okay, eight days. That's what we're Okay. So, 
Hutch time, they get four days. That's right. Hutch time, they don't work on Friday. That's right. They don't work on Monday or Friday. There you go. It doesn't. So, yeah, jeez. We have two days. Four days at the most. But the point is this. Under the Constitution, the President clearly has the right to use his power to appoint people to fill positions of the government. Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2 is the Appointments Clause, okay? But that Appointments Clause also comes with the idea, from the standpoint of the checks and balances of separation of powers, with the advice and consent of the Senate, okay? So the Senate gets a chance to research these people, to do some background checks, get the FBI to go out and pull together files on them, and say, these are the people the president's nominating. You're going to have to have a debate on this. They go into committee. They get questioned, like Chuck Hagel and Brennan did, or if you, if you call that questioning. I mean, there was a couple questions to ask, but generally they got through. But so that process usually happens as part of, part of the advice and consent of the Senate. And then the Senate, generally, for the most part, takes those nominees to that process, and they have a vote on the floor of the U.S. Senate. We saw that exercise with Chuck Hagel. How long did that go on? Two months? Two months, yeah, two months about it. Because Hagel was rumored prior to you know the, the next term, that kind of thing. So two months happened. So how many days are we at now with our NRB? Twelve. 12. 12. Wow. Worst case twelve. Yeah, that's right. Best or excuse me, best case twelve. So the president comes in and says, in the meantime, the Senate is is holding what they call session, but it's really a pro forma session. They're still in session. And interestingly enough, the president's payroll tax exemption passed during this period between December 15th and January 4th. So the Senate was obviously doing work. The President wanted them to extend the Bush tax cut, the payroll tax cuts. They did that. And so they actually did the work. Well, on January 4th, the President stands up and says, we have to get do the work of the people. This Senate's not doing anything. I deem them to not be meeting. I deem them to be in recess. And therefore, I recess. I use the recess appointment power of the executive branch to put all these people in office. So three members of the National Labor Relations Board, one member of the Consumer Financial Protection Board. Well, he's using the power that's given to the president under Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3, the recess one power of the executive branch. Article 2 is the, is the executive investment power. However, the, there's a small problem with that. Now, remember, this president is a constitutional scholar. He taught constitutional scholar. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. You don't laugh about that. Now, they, this guy taught our, our, our aspiring attorneys and... And, and MBAs, what the Constitution meant and how it should be interpreted. Okay, so so we get to this. Now, originally, Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3 contemplated a time when Congress met for two months. There was a time when people in Washington had other jobs. They would actually go home and harvest and cut the fields and, and, and they would ride their horses out to across the land and take days, weeks, if not months to get home. They do their work, they go talk to their constituents to do their work, and then, you know, at the end of the next session, they would come into the second session of Congress in January, come in, they spend some marks, and they go home. Well, in the session, in the, in the time between the first session and the second session of any Congress, we have two year Congresses, first session, second session, the founding fathers believed that there were times when the president might suffer the death of an executive, like the Secretary of Defense, for example. The Secretary of Defense may die during that interregnum between the first session and the second session. So they put in this recess appointment power saying the president can appoint and he can put someone to fill that job until the next session And then Article 2, Section 2, Clause 2 comes in and the advice and consent process has to be undertaken. Well, the other part of this, very important part of this, is that the words of Article, who's that constitution? Okay, pull that Article 2, Section 2, Clause 3, and tell me whether or not the word recess is capitalized or it's lowercase. Any English majors in the room? <laughs> there, good. Okay. Usually when a word is capitalized, a noun, it means to say proper noun, and therefore it refers to a specific thing. Right? The name of it. It's the name of it. The recess. So when you say the recess, capital R, you're talking about a specific event. Not a recess. Not any recess. You're talking about the recess. Okay. Is it capitalized in your country? I hope it is, because my story falls apart completely. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, take my word for it, it is. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yes. The Court of Appeals. Recess is capitalized. Okay, so it's the yeah. recess. Okay. So now, what's happened over the course of the time that passes, where Congress is now a full-time institution, where you know they're in, they're out, they're they're all about. Um, <laughs> they're all about. 
Um, so now the recent appointment power is kind of a political tool. When a, when a nominee, a controversial nominee, runs into trouble, the president will say, okay, well, they're going to go out on August recess, or they're going to go out you know, on recess for Memorial Day, or they're going to go out on recess on 4th of July, and I'll just use, the re I'll use that recess, small r recess, to use my power under Article 2, uh, Section 2, Clause 3. Well, this, interestingly enough, the other part of this is that under the legislative vesting power, Article 1, Section 5, Clause 4, it says for the con in order for the Congress to recess, both chambers must pass a resolution, a concurrent resolution, if they're going to recess for more than three days. In the context of our, re of our president, our constitutional scholar exercising this authority, there was never a concurrent resolution for a recess. So first of all, we're never in recess, okay? It's established, the evidence is that resolution did not pass, was never passed, was never contemplated, so they're not in recess. So the president stands up and says, I don't believe what they're doing is of such a nature that I believe it's a session of Congress. You, you laugh about that, but that's exactly what he said. I am now determining what Congress is doing, whether or not they're in session or out of session. If you go back to the Declaration of Independence, 1776, and you read it, one of the objections of those who signed it was the king would convene legislatures in places and locations and time uncomfortable to the legislative bodies. Meaning that in order to get his will, he would say, okay, we're all going out to, you know, we're going down to uh, the Fountain of Youth in Florida. We're going to have a meeting there. We're going to decide good things. So the king would get his will. <coughs> so this is one of the original objections to the Declaration. And this president says, I'll tell you when you're meeting. I'll tell you whether or not I believe the actions you're taking are of a nature that, that would prove that you're in session. Well, needless to say, that was wrong. And so we filed a series of lawsuits. We have, at any given time, the National Right to Work Legal Defense Foundation, we have about 200 cases pending. We represent only employees whose rights have been violated under the law. We want, we've been to the U.S. Supreme Court 15 times. We won a major case in June of last year on behalf of teachers and government workers in California. I don't need to do the promotional bit here, but we do the Lord's work when it comes to individual workers and standing up and establishing the precedents that protect workers from forced unionism. So we have numerous cases. We have 64 cases in front of the National Labor Relations Board. 58 of them were out into the, excuse me, 56 of them were out into the regions. There's regional directors that adjudicate cases. And then there are cases that come back to the board for decisions. We had eight cases in front of the board. So we said, we wrote a note to all the board saying, in every one of these cases, we don't believe that these board members are properly seated and therefore cannot decide these cases. Okay? They're not appropriately seated, therefore they have no authority, they cannot rule. Well, so these cases proceed. We argued the first case on the constitutionality of the Obama recesses in Chicago a week before the argument case in D.C., which was the case called Noel Cannon. The judge there at the Court of Appeals actually took our amicus brief, which was based on this interpretation I just gave to you, capital R, intra versus inter part in a session of recess. That's another big question. The Constitution contemplates inter-session recesses between the first and the second, not intra-session recesses, not August, unless, they, unless they're going from one session to the other. More importantly, the Constitution says if the vacancy occurs during the recess, the capital R recess. So it's not like this is vacant in June, we're in session, there's a vacancy, I can use my, the vacancy did not occur inter-session, it occurred intra-session. So we write this brief up, you read the amicus brief, it's a really beautiful amicus brief, it's beautiful. The court ignores really the, 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 the arguments of the, of the two combatants in the case called Noel Cannon. Noel Cannon was a candy company up in Washington State, the union, and they were fighting over some interpretation of their contract. Judge Santel, former Jesse Helmstadt, I didn't know this, the guy's about 85 years old, he's a judge emeritus, he takes this thing and he writes an originalist decision. He went right to the Constitution of the United States and he said, this is what it says. This is what it says, and what you've done is not what it says. And therefore, what you've done is unconstitutional. And so, of course, the NLRB immediately puts that person and says, we don't believe the court's right, we're going to continue to work. Well, the next step then is the National Right to Work Foundation files a writ of mandamus or prohibition. Now, he's going to have to go back to his Black's Law Book to figure this out. He knows what a mandamus writ is, but a writ of prohibition is a very, very rarely exercised legal option. So we file a writ of mandamus. Mandamus means you must act. We're asking a higher authority to tell these people to do the right thing. A writ of prohibition and or prohibition says, 
None of that. We're going to stop you from doing anything more. And these things are usually just throwaways. They're more window dressing than anything else. They don't improve on it. But believe it or not, that court, that court of appeals, demanded that the NLRB respond to our writ of prohibition and writ of mandamus. Which means there's a pretty good, pretty good chance that when they get their 30 days to do this, this judge is going to shut the entire NLRB down, and we're going to get them, stop them from doing anything anywhere in the country okay. until the president gets it done. That's the kind of legal work that we're able to do. <laughs> Well, the Boeing suit, now this is another interesting case. That, we were involved in that case too. We were partying that litigation on behalf of Boeing. For those of you who may not remember this, this was the National Labor Relations Board, the general counsel who's a, serving as a re, re, acting general counsel. He's never been confirmed or nominated because the president doesn't dare to put him in front of the Senate because it would be voted down. He, what happened was, Boeing is building the 787 Dreamliner, which we hope soon will get back up in the air, and I don't know all the issues about that, but hopefully it'll be back in the air. But, they went, to the, they went to the machinist union in Washington State, and they said, look, we've got 825 orders, back orders, for this 787 aircraft. The state of the art, you know, you know the details about it. The only thing they can't get right is the battery. Of course, my cell phone doesn't get my lithium battery right. <laughs> you don't have a problem there. But the point is, is that they went to the machinist union, who had struck the company five times over the last 20 years. The last strike cost the company over $1.4 billion in revenue. And they said to the machinist, said, look, please, can we just get an agreement so that we can get continuity of production for the 787 so we can meet the, the orders that have come in on this aircraft? And the machinist union said, you know what? We don't have to agree to anything. And they were right. They don't, they don't have to agree to give up any of this. But they wouldn't agree to it. So what does Boeing do? They go and they start looking for other places to locate production facilities. And they end up in the right to work state of South Carolina. They invest a billion dollars. They hire a thousand new people. They've got this factory completely built. Anybody flies into North Charleston, Airport, you'll see it. It's unbelievable. Illinois, more important, O'Fallon would love to have this, frankly. I mean, they would love to have this facility. There are now over 6,000 jobs down there. There are people moving into the area. Gross. These are all manufacturing yeah, They're all manufacturing jobs. They're big jobs. So, so three weeks before they're going to cut the ribbon on this new facility, the general counsel of the National Labor Relations Board files a complaint against Boeing saying that they have retaliated against the union by building this facility in South Carolina in the right to work state is not a new facility. And because of their, their calling the union up here and saying, if you don't give up your right to strike, you have now violated labor law, and you've shown anti-union animus, and therefore, if you are convicted of this charge, you will not be able to produce aircraft in that South Carolina facility. It's already been built. It's already been built. People are already working. So we, did, we jump in on behalf of South Carolina workers. We're granted intervener status, and we go out in June of 2000, gosh, when was this? 2011, I think it was, in Seattle. And we start, we, we're there for the opening day of the hearings in, in front of the Administrative Law Judge of the National Labor Relations Board. The moment he gavels in the hearing, the lawyers for Boeing, the union, and the National Labor Relations Board stand up and say, we, Mr. Uh, Administrative Law Judge, we're going to go behind the door, close doors, and work this all out. Four or five months later, the whole thing comes apart. They have a hearing in front of the Administrative Law Judge. We didn't even get invited, which was a violation of procedure. I mean, we're literally a party in the case. They don't call us if they're having this hearing. Um, and it's all done by phone. We get a transcript of it. And the union and Boeing and the NLRB say, Mr. Administrative Law Judge, we would like this to go away. And he says, well, you mean you want me to dismiss the case? Goes, no, 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 no. We don't want to dismiss it. We don't want any settlement. We don't want any record. We want it to be as if it never happened. And the well, Administrative Law Judge says, wait a minute. We've gaveled in this proceeding. I mean, this is an official legal proceeding. I, you know, there's certain rules that I have to follow. And, you know, all the parties are not here. He called us friends. He was... He mistaken the transcript called his friends in the court were actually parties. He said, the friends aren't here. We can't do this. He said, well, sir, this is not really an official hearing. We just like to have this all kind of just disappear. And it took the judge about three pages of transcript to understand what they were trying to do. And then at the end, he said, well, now that we finesse this, and he used that word finesse. When a judge uses the word finesse on a transcript, he's, cre he's created real trouble for himself. We filed, like I said, we filed charges against this guy. Of course, they were dismissed. But it was important to let these guys know that we'll fight them anywhere, anytime, anyplace. We can't get away with this crap. So the point is, is the case just goes away. The next day, we get an announcement from Boeing that they've agreed to a new four-year contract with the Machinist Union that all the 737 aircraft, those are the ones the Southwest Airlines flies, you guys see coming into St. Louis, that all those, man, all those aircraft are going to be built in Washington State under the Union contract. 
So Boeing, you know, being a publicly traded company, who's got huge leverage, they've got a huge government purchasing exposure. I mean, I think fifty percent of their market is government. So you've got to know the government's now impersonating says, guys, yeah, you wanna you wanna have some more aircraft, you wanna build any more bombers, you need to get this thing cleaned up. So this was a perfect Obama, Rahm Emanuel, kind of mafioso, Chicago-style intimidation job of a private company, a Republic company, and now that textbook model is in place. The case is actually over, um, so we won't go back and get Bond because there was no, quote, no case. But all the cases that went back to that period are now in play and can be repealed if this, if this board is adjudicated as being unconsciously seated. There's about, we estimate there's about 1,400 cases that have to be redone. Many of them wouldn't be because most of the NLRB settlements are simply you as a business have to post this notice on the wall saying, I will no longer do this. Yeah. That's all. And you don't relitigate that stuff. But our cases, our cases, we're going to relitigate all of our cases. In fact, we have a major case that the board ruled on right before they, this all came about where they literally, from an administrative uh, agency standpoint, overturned a Supreme Court decision that we won back in 1988. So we've got a lot, we've got a lot of stake in this. And that's why we're so involved in that process. Okay, right here and then over there. Yes, ma'am. You grew up on a farm. Yes, ma'am. I did too. I can recognize when manure is being produced. Which brings me to the point of our local teachers union. Mm. How do you put the crack in the union and get the teachers to understand that the union is not looking after the children, the union is not looking after the teachers, the union is looking after the union officials. How do we work that? That's a great question. And there's a guy, Jack Roser, of the Carpentersville, Illinois. You know Jack? Jack has got a whole program focused specifically on teachers. He's using some public service announcements. He's using, we're actually going to help him litigate for teachers to call him and say, how do we get out of this monopoly? You know, the union's claim, the teacher union claim is that they walk up to a young teacher and they say, you know, if Johnny gets hurt in your classroom, you can have a liability. And therefore, you meet our liability in order to cover you and protect you in the classroom. They don't talk about anything else, no professional standards. They just say, it's a liability issue. Unfortunately, their liability insurance costs $900 a year. An umbrella policy on your homeowners, what does that cost? $99 a year. You get the same coverage, but the union officials won't tell you this. Um, the biggest claim that the unions have on young teachers entering the profession is this threat of liability and all this other stuff. There are some that want to join them, you know, more power to them. But the teachers union, the idea that they've been granted a monopoly in Springfield to bargain on behalf of all teachers. No teacher can get out from underneath it. You know, we had cases, we had a case in North Dakota where North Dakota tried to incentivize science and math teachers to come to their school system. They were going to pay them a $10,000 signing bonus to get a math teacher or a science teacher to come to their school districts. Who do you think filed a suit to block that? The, union. the teachers union, absolutely. Just the other day, up in, up in um, uh, Pennsylvania at a, at a grocery store, I, I'll go back to the teacher profession in a minute, but a grocery store. Uh, the owner of a chain grocery store, they, he had, uh, I think, seven employees that had done amazing work. There was something they'd done, so he wanted to give them a bonus. He gave them all bonus. Guess who filed a grievance against the employer? Of course. The union. Exactly. They said, you either got to pay everybody this money, or you can't pay anybody. So the judge in the case, in the Western, Western District of Pennsylvania, said, in, to, in, in his new news, he said, this is kind of interesting. You, the union officials, are coming before me asking me to take away money from the very workers you let Is that right? And the union said, yes, sir, that's right. It's because of this monopoly power they have. And in the teaching profession, it's even more amazing. Because we have, you know, we get to this point now where we think that government education is a right. We use that word right. We throw it out there like, like oh, yeah, it's a right. We stomp our feet for all these rights. I've got a right for you to pay my mortgage. You know, no. But government monopoly schooling has attracted government monopoly unions. And government monopoly unions have become the most powerful political player in most states where they operate. There's no question about that. Mm. And the only thing we can do, we can go back to Scott Walker's model, we can go after it and say, you know what, no more. We're not going to bargain with you. In Illinois, um, I think getting information out to teachers and Jack Roser, I would encourage, I've heard the name of his group is, but he's got a, he's got a group that, and they, he's investing some significant money into making sure that teachers across the state get this information about how they can get out of the union, stop paying union dues, um, and can join independent unions uh, or independent teacher groups. We've helped develop uh, national teacher groups called the American Association of Educators. They provide liability insurance for $89 a year that's equal to the unions. I mean, 
you know, we can't, unfortunately, the state legislature won't let them use the mailboxes in the state. They won't let them use the communication vehicles that the union gets to use. It's just a function of getting out there and talking to folks. Either that or solving the problem in Springfield, which probably is a little harder to do these days. But you're right. This is, as we talked about earlier, and Ralph recognized, there are more government union members in America than there are private union members. So that's the final frontier for organized labor. So they will grab onto that piece. And of course, from a, if you're a progressive, and you want to control the next generation, what do you do? You take over the schools, and you teach, and you grab the schools. I mean, the communists laid this out in a 100-point task day. Look, give us the schools. You, look, you do all the war building you want. Give us one generation of the children, and we'll change the world. And we'll change it. Yeah. OK, question Go back to your analysis. Yes, it will go to the court. The, the court has given the NLRB 30 days to either ask for an on bond hearing the entire Court of Appeals in, in the District of Columbia or go to the U.S. Supreme Court. I think it will go to the Supreme Court. And the court will decide. And I would suspect, for those of you who, who are court watchers, I would suspect that we're not going to like what happens in the court. They're going to get, I can just see it today. I can see John Roberts siding with four other justices, the liberal justice, saying, you know, the Constitution is a living document, no. you know, and therefore no one, they wouldn't have contemplated that we'd be in year round and all this and the recesses would occur. And so the recess is going to end up being small r recess. And I, I hope that doesn't happen. We'll pray that it doesn't happen. But I would suspect that this, if we win this case, it changes everything. It will be a rewrite. Yeah, it changes everything if we win this case. It takes away a significant piece of power that presidents, Republican and Democrat, have used politically over the years and gotten away from what the Constitution says. So I'm, I'm prepared to win it fully and hold both parties uh, accountable to, to how they're using the Constitution. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I saw him there and he got up and I was like, yeah. Um, how many uh, administrators do you think there are in the well, I, I started doing this work in 1986. Uh, I've been around for a long time. I, I worked in the states for the most part. I started doing federal legislation in 1995 and, um, and started looking for it. I have a question. Because this uh, alleged constitution structure, we can't do all this stuff up. I want to know, and this may, I don't mean to put you on the spot, in your opinion, where is so much of the stuff coming from? Where, where is it coming from? And how are they getting written so fast and so fast? Well, I, I think if you look at the origin and the background, the history of Barack Obama, and you look at you know look at any any president, uh, you begin to see kind of the fundamental training. Um, and you know, he, I, I, this was lost. I didn't get this, but when we did campaign in 2008, somebody made a bumper sticker of this. I have it now. This is Barack Obama campaign trip. said, we live in the greatest country the world has ever created. I hope you'll join me in trying to change it. <laughs> that's what he said. So, so I can't explain it, but I can tell you that's his worldview. His worldview. And his worldview is predicated on this notion. Like most utopians, you know, they believe that if we just get the control, that if we, everybody will get along, and it takes human nature out of it. And that's the, that's the inherent train wreck between their worldview and the Founding Fathers' ability to recognize human nature. We are sinful people. When given the chance, we, we are not good people. I don't believe it. I, I like to think that my six-year-old is good, but I'm telling you. <laughs> <laughs> that sermon that you get, you know, when they talk about the innocence of children and, and the victims of abortion and others, uh, my wife and I have a, a very, very strong commitment to the pro-life movement, but you know there is a point where there's innocence to the point where God will take these people and lift them up, and we will see them. But there's a point when when human nature kicks in, that sin nature kicks in, and and whether 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 you you, you make the case there are there are libertarian atheists who make the case that the Constitution and the Declaration were understands the human nature, and there are those of us that make the idea that they were divinely inspired. They read the Bible. They understood. The inherent nature of man, and they protect. They're trying to protect us from it, and that's where we. And this guy, you know, I don't know. I don't know. We live in the greatest nation the world's ever known. Join me to help change it. That's how it goes. Wow. Wow. Okay. I will hang around. Mary, I'm sorry. I went. Did I go beyond? Or? Oh, you're fine. I'll stick around. I'll stick around.